I am on. All right. I am on on a Friday, on a rainy Friday. All right. Um, so we uh, we continue Monte Carlo methods. I want to say a little bit uh, about uh, uh, random variable generation. In some sense, uh, that's a subject you don't really have to worry too much because if you use existing statistical libraries, everything has already been programmed there. Uh, but you know, if you try to do this with uh, Python or something like that, you may have to program these things. So it's not like uh, uh, you can sample from anything because somebody else has done it. Okay, so I need to tell you some of the basic things and also introduce ideas that are essential to our problem. All right, so we discuss about uh, evaluating expectations of actions like that with Monte Carlo and uh, uh, the the way actually that I see here that I have written this expectation uh, looks a little bit weird as you have put a pi star there to be consistent with the other notation. So this pi star divided by this, this thing is the, uh, I'm assuming when I write this, that this pi is normalized, right? So pi divided by this normalization factor is the actual distribution, okay? Um, all right. So uh, we discuss the how we calculate this with um, uh, samples from the distribution. And uh, uh, everything was based on the law of large nu numbers and uh, the central limit uh, theorem. Uh, we discuss extensively the convergence rate is 1 over square root of n. So this is the mean uh, square error that you get in the estimator. And this is independent of the dimensionality, basically, of your problem. Um, let's see what else is new. The estimator is uh, unbiased, okay? So the expectation of this estimator is actually the true expectation of f of x, uh, and the variance is given the variance of f of x divided by n. All right, so nothing important. And of course, uh, what we need to discuss today uh, to make this algorithm to work is the first step is sample from pi of x, and so we have discussed what that uh, actually uh, requires. How do we sample from distributions? Uh, uh, a little bit of notation that we discuss. Uh, how do we call this? So this is sort of the Monte Carlo approximation, or the empirical measure of the distribution. And uh, so if you take n samples from the distribution, uh, you can approximate this non-parametrical distribution like that, okay? And somehow it happens that the estimates we discussed, the Monte Carlo estimates, are really nothing else but the expectations of f of x computed with this uh, approximation that you see there, all right? So that's why this is very useful, okay? And it is non-parametric. You don't say it's Gaussian, you don't say it's student t. It's completely defined by particles and actually this representation that you see here, it will be the starting step to do sequential Monte Carlo uh, uh, type of methods uh, for static and dynamic problems. So, uh, so when you take the expectation under this uh, Monte Carlo estimate, you actually get uh, uh, this estimate that we have seen before. So uh, a good way basically to go directly on this is to use an approximation of the distribution, then get expectations under this distribution. And I indicate on the bottom uh, some notation that um, uh, sort of uh, you may want to get used to. So this is our estimate, all right? So this is our estimate here. And you notice this is the expectation with respect to the actual distribution of x. This is the true expectation because the estimator is unbiased and the variance under the true distribution of x is the variance of f divided by n. So the notation looks heavy, but everything is very important in this notation. So what is uh, uh, this thing means there? This is the expectation of f, taking which distribution? The empirical distribution, right? Pi hat is the empirical using n samples, right? And, um, uh, and then, you know, uh, to discuss what the, that this is unbiased, we take the, the expectation with respect to the true distribution of x, and then uh, the variance is the variance of f over n. All right. 
Um, so the uh, something I'm not going to discuss because it will uh, uh, get us completely out of uh, uh, focus for this class is that every random uh, number generator is actually based one way or another uh, on the assumption that we know how to sample from the uniform distribution. Okay, so this is sort of the most fundamental uh, problem in probability on how to sample from uh, this uniform distribution, and this. Um, uh, there are many algorithms that generate what's called pseudo-random numbers. Uh, pseudo in the sense that most of the algorithms that sample from the uniform distribution are really deterministic algorithms. Okay? Uh, so I am not going to discuss this and it's not really worth it for this class to bother. So let's assume that somehow we know how to sample from the uniform distribution. Right? That's our starting point. And actually, what, uh, in the first part of the lecture today, I'm going to show you how, in some sense, by sampling from the uniform distribution, you can uh, eventually sample from any arbitrary distribution. All right. Uh, so what, uh, the first thing I want to discuss a little bit is about how we sample from a discrete distribution. So let's say we have a discrete distribution that has three states, one, two, three, and the corresponding probability of x equal one is one sixth, two is two sixths, and one half. Okay. So how do we sample? Any ideas? So if I give you this discrete distribution, how do you sample from it? What's the idea? And I can just give it as a common and say go and sample. How are we going to sample from this discrete distribution? And I remind you that sampling from any arbitrary distribution, eventually, the starting point may be something from the uniform distribution. So uh, if you sample, uh, if you take sample from the uniform distribution, can you make some rules based on that sample if uh, you're sampling x equal 1, x equal 2, or x equal 3? OK, so let's make an algorithm for that. So first thing is I want to define the CDF of the discrete distribution. So I want you to look at this uh, very nice notation and um, agree with me that uh, this is indeed the CDF of the discrete distribution. All right? So basically, in the CDF, you sample all of these probabilities of the discrete events, right? And there is an indicator function. If you want to calculate uh, the CDF at location x, uh, there is an indicator function that says take all the i's that they are less or equal to x. Okay? So, for example, uh, there was a pixel somewhere. Uh, so, let me, I'm going to go back to the previous slide. So, if uh, 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 these are, let's say, the, dis the discrete probability, it's a different example from what I had before, uh, the CDF will look like that. All right? Is that correct? Does it correspond to this? So we okay, have one, two, three, four, five, right? So this is good, okay? So the CDF basically uh, zero here. It jumps here with what, how much is this jump? It's equal to the probability of state one. And then it goes up to two jumps with the probability of state two. So the CDF, you sum P1 and P2 and then plus P3 and P4 and P5 and then you get equal to one, okay? So this is how the CDF for the discrete distribution looks like. So uh, I am going to define the inverse of the CDF, and I'm going to show you this graphically, as effectively uh, the minimum of the, uh, of the out of the states of the discrete distribution, so the minimum x for which the CDF is greater or equal to u. Okay? So you sample a u from the uniform distribution, and uh, this uh, uh, inverse CDF uh, corresponds to the minimum of x for which the CDF at x is greater or equal to u. So for example, uh, let me look at this picture. Uh, let's say that you sample a u that uh, brings you there. Right here we are from 0 to 1. Okay, So I'm going to sample uh, a u that somehow brings me there. What state do you select then? We will take the minimum of x for which the CDF of that x is greater or equal to u. So what state do we pick up for that point here, this point? 2. Okay. Uh, similarly, if you are there, 
uh, you pick up three, four, and then uh, five. Now, uh, you may say, you told us this, but I don't believe you. Why is this working? All right? And in uh, everything that is common sense, you should be able to actually do a little proof. So let me do a little proof of this. So I'm going to define uh, the CDF is really, uh, 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 you know, this uh, summation here that you see. So I'm going to define uh, P, capital P of K, to mean the summation of from J1 to K of the probabilities PJ, all right? And this goes from 0 to 1, okay? So this is really my CDF. So P of 0 equal to 0, P, uh, if I have infinite states equal to 1, P1, capital P1 is P1, right? So this is my definition. And... Um, uh, so, would you agree with me that uh, this capital P subscript K is the probability that X is less or equal to K? Right? Okay. So, uh, here is the idea. We're going to select, here's the algorithm and we're going to prove it. We select a U from the uniform distribution and then we're going to select uh, uh, corresponding to this U the state k that is the minimum of all possible k's for which u is less or equal to capital P of k. And I'm going to make a proof of this. You remember we said we're going to pick up, uh, you know, in, I had this in the previous equation. I'm writing here in the discrete form. So we're going to pick up the k for which capital P of k is greater or equal to u. So for example, you know, this is P1, this is P2. If the u is here, we're going to pick up the state for which the capital P is greater or equal to U. So in this case, it's state, it's state uh, uh, two. So let me see uh, if we have the proof somewhere. So here's the proof. Um, it's very simple. Uh, the probability basically that I will select X equal to K is the probability that U is between PK minus one and PK. We agree. Okay, so uh, U is a uniform distribution. So do you agree that this probability is equal because the probability density is one, uh, integral du from pk minus one to pk? And this is this, and uh, the two summations, basically this term will cancel out and you get pk. So indeed the probability of x equal k is pk. So we're really something correctly. So the common sense basically argument here prevails and it tells you that to sample from the discrete distribution, uh, sample U, and then based on that U, select the K that is defined from this uh, nice statement that you see here. All right. Uh, now we have to extend this to continuous distributions, okay? The same idea, actually, uh, but the CDF, uh, it will involve uh, continuous distribution. So uh, let me remind you what the CDF uh, is. Is this integral from minus infinity to X? Uh, this is what you are familiar with the CDF, but actually a much better notation uh, is this notation here that I put in blue. So really, if you write uh, something you know, in a paper, this is a much better notation. Do we agree that this integral is the same as that? Okay, so the thing is, you change the limits always from minus infinity to uh, plus infinity, but having the indicator function u less or equal to x, right? Uh, effectively, you're only integrating up to x because everything else basically will drop to zero. You see that? Because of the indicator function, right, if uh, u is greater than x, uh, uh, this will give you zero. So really, it's the same thing as integrating up to x. But this notation is better because effectively, for all uh, situations, you use as limits of integration minus infinity to infinity. All right? It's a more uh, rigorous way of writing this. So here is the trivial algorithm. You sample the U from the uniform distribution, and then you set X to be uh, the inverse CDF computed at U. That's it. Okay? Nothing fancy, right? Because the CDF goes from 0 to 1. You sample the U, and then uh, uh, you, uh, from assuming you have this, uh, you evaluate that U, and that will be your sample X. And then, uh, the idea is that this sample X will be a sample from the actual distribution uh, P. And I actually give you the proof here. Uh, everything has a proof, right? So uh, let's calculate the probability of capital X being less or equal to X, okay? Uh, now, this is equivalent. 
with the probability of u being less or equal to the CDF computed little x. All right? Think the CDF, right? You are looking at the probability of capital X less than little x is the same as the probability of u less or equal to that. And because this is a uniform distribution, really this probability is equal to that. Okay, you can see here because the probability is one. So effectively, if this is equal to that, which means this is the CDF of uh, the distribution pi. So basically, this is the correct sample out of the distribution pi. All right, so let me show you this graphically. You know, uh, if this is the CDF, you, you sample u from 0 to 1. Uh, and then basically, you compute this y. And this y, you set it equal to your, to your I don't know why we use y and x, but basically, if you invert it, you set x equal to y, and that's a sample from the actual uh, uh, distribution of interest. Now, this is obviously a very nice uh, way to sample from arbitrary distributions. It works very nice for uh, uh, simple distributions, but if I give you something in uh, uh, 50 dimensions, you will not be able, you won't even know what the CDF is. Okay, so this is not going to work, but at least you see in action uh, sampling from the uniform, and somehow from there you can actually sample from more complex distributions. So, for example, if uh, you try to sample from uh, uh, the univariate normal distribution, uh, this is the CDF of uh, the Gaussian. You sample u from 0 to 1, and immediately you set its value of x, and that's a sample from the Gaussian. So, in principle, we know how to sample from Gaussians, and I'm going from univariate Gaussians, and I'm going to show you a few other algorithms for the Gaussian as well uh, uh, later in the lecture today. All right, so let me uh, uh, apply this method to a little bit more complex distributions to uh, introduce uh, uh, what is called the transformation methods, which are very essential. Uh, so let me say that uh, here's our problem. We want to take a sample from the exponential distribution with parameter lambda. If you have not seen the exponential distribution, basically it's defined from 0 to infinity, and it is lambda e to the minus lambda x. Okay, so we're going to... Uh, use this uh, uh, inversion method, so we require to compute the CDF. So if you integrate this from minus infinity to x, basically the CDF is 0 if x less or equal to 0, and 1 minus e to the minus lambda x if x greater than 0. Easy, we compute the CDF. So how is the... Uh, uh, um, so if we sample here from the uniform distribution, can you tell me how, what the x is going to look like? So I sample u from 0 to 1, and now we need to invert according to uh, what we discussed already. So what would be the x looking at this? So I give you a sample u from the uniform. What is x? All right, so you set this equal to u. So what would be x? 1 minus u log divided by... Uh, uh, minus 1 over lambda, right? Yes, no? Is this correct? If you set this equal to u, right? So x equals minus 1 over lambda log of 1 minus u, right? That's the inverse CDF computed u. Correct? All right. So you know what that means, actually? Uh, that uh, if u is a uniform random variable from 0 to 1, then x as minus 1 over lambda log of 1 minus u, it's actually a random variable from the exponential distribution of lambda. This is now, even though we derive this with uh, this inversion of the CDF, now we introduce the concept of transformation of variables. And here is an extremely useful distribution, right? You start with u being uniform random variable, log of 1 minus u times minus 1 over lambda, is, is uh, actually a distribution in the exponential family, I mean exponential, sorry, distribution with parameter lambda. Okay? And uh, actually you can show uh, the derivation is trivial, okay? I'm not going to go through the derivation here. You can also show that minus 1 over lambda of log of u is also from the exponential distribution with parameter lambda. So these are sort of the simplest possible transformations where you take a uniform distribution and somehow uh, you transform it to the exponential distribution. Okay? So think of this, even though we did the derivation by inverting the CDF, uh, really 
this is uh, sort of a transformation that takes you from one type of distribution to another type of distribution. So how does uh, uh, this work again? You know, uh, the same ideas before. You sample u from 0 to 1. Uh, you compute the inverse CDF at u. Uh, and you set that sample equal to x. And uh, this is uh, samples basically from the exponential distribution. It's a histogram where you generate by taking samples to start with from the uniform distribution. Right? So very sort of uh, uh, simple way to sample uh, from the uniform distribution. Now, let me give you another example. Okay? Um, let's say that uh, you have uh, samples x uh, coming from some distribution f, and you take n of the samples, and you want to find, uh, you want to sample from the distribution of z, the underlying distribution of z. So the sample sex come from this distribution of f, and you take n of those, you define this to be the max of x1, xn, and you want to sample from the underlying distribution of this max of, of these elements. I mean, if x1 and xn are random variables, right, from this, drawn from this distribution, I want to find the distribution of the maximum of this. Okay? So what you do is, you define the CDF, the standard definition, and, and uh, so the CDF of this is the product over n, because these are IID samples of these probabilities, and these probabilities, you know what they are? Each of them is basically the CDF computed at z, and because I have n to the power n, right? And then you know what? It's very simple. You sample from u from the uniform distribution, and then what is the corresponding sample of z is basically u to the power one over n, and then uh, inverse of the CDF fx. So basically, if you take the inverse CDF of uh, f and you compute it at u to the power 1 over n, the sample generated is the sample of the underlying distribution of this max of x1 to xn. You can do lots of little homework problems like that, right? So this is, um, you know, uh, how we take samples from this distribution. Uh, all right, so obviously uh, this method is very limited to simple distributions, okay? You're supposed to know uh, the CDF, and usually you don't, so not very practical. So, uh, so let's try to generalize a little bit these transformation methods. I am not going to give you any proofs because uh, it will take us basically ten lectures to go through each proof of this. But you already have seen uh, that uh, if u is uniform, uh, then the variable x defined uh, with this formula or this formula with the log of u and log of one minus u. Uh, is uh, actually a distribution that follows this exponential uh, distribution with uh, parameter lambda. So the question is, are there any other transforms that look like that, that somehow uh, are powerful, you know, that we can go from the uniform distribution to some other distribution? And the answer is yes. So let me give you some. You maybe have never seen those before, okay? So let's say that you have samples from the exponential uh, distribution with parameter lambda equal to 1, then if you take the summation of uh, these samples from i, one, I equal 1 to nu, then this is a t-square uh, sample from the t-square distribution, or chi-square, how you call it. If you take now uh, another summation from i1 to alpha, assuming alpha is an integer, times beta, then this is surprisingly a sample from the gamma distribution with parameters alpha and beta, and if you take the ratio of these things, then this is a sample from the beta distribution. How do you like that? And you may say, yeah, nice, but then I need to, to sample from the exponential distribution. Yeah, the exponential distribution you sample by sampling in the uniform distribution. So basically, we sample, uh, you put lambda equal to 1, you sample u from the uniform, you take, let's say, minus log of 1 minus u, and you generate the samples, take the summations, you have samples from this distribution, the gamma, the beta, uh, ready to go. Okay? Now, bad news, of course, I didn't tell you anything, but uh, this uh, methodology that I saw you here, uh, yes, you can sample from the gamma and beta, but it requires, let's say, that this alpha is an integer. So if it's alpha is not an integer, this doesn't work. Okay? Uh, I'm actually going to show you, I, 
I think uh, uh, last year when I was teaching this class, it really I was looking to find how do you sample from the gamma distribution, you know, and uh, for um, uh, any number alpha and beta, okay? And I'm going to show you a, a, a methodology that I found in a paper published from someone at Stanford uh, almost 25 years ago. And if you dig on the web, there is a wonderful little algorithm that works and gives you samples of the gamma distribution, you know. So somewhere in the notes, I will show you this uh, in a little while. All right, so we discuss all of this, okay? Um, so, um, so here is a, uh, uh, how to sample from Gaussians, okay? So let me uh, uh, see how we're gonna go on this. Um, so first I'm gonna give you, without a proof, uh, another transformation uh, of uh, distributions. If you have samples from the standard normal, all right, then, and you notice it's underlined there because that underlying thing that means somewhere there is a proof that the good students, my class, can go and read it, okay? Uh, these are extremely powerful, by the way, type of transformations. So if x1 and xn are samples from the standard normal, x1 squared and xn squared are uh, samples from this uh, uh, chi-squared distribution, and if n is equal to 2, actually this distribution is the uh, exponential distribution with parameter 1 half. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to show you how we sample uh, from the Gaussian by using this identity on a reverse, right? Using this identity on reverse. So let's see how we're going to do this. Uh, so think, so uh, we take x and y to be sort of like uh, Cartesian coordinates, uh, where x1 is standard normal, x2 is standard normal. And we're going to find uh, from the Cartesian coordinates, polar coordinates are and theta. So you agree with me that uh, uh, r squared is x1 squared and x2 squared, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, um, now, according to this little theorem, right? Uh, if x1 is from the normal uh, standard Gaussian, x2 from the standard Gaussian, then x1 squared plus x2 squared is from the uh, exponential distribution with parameter 1 half. And I take the radius, I'm sorry, the angle, to be from the uniform distribution from 0 to pi. So look at these two equations here. Can you now tell me an algorithm on how to compute samples of x1 and x2 from the standard Gaussian? I mean, it's just a simple algorithm. So I just told you that R square, if x1 and x2 are from standard Gaussians, then uh, R square is from this exponential uh, distribution, one half parameter, and theta is from the uniform distribution. So um, uh, very easy to sample, right? We know how to sample from 0 to 1, so we can sample from 0 to 2 pi. So what's the algorithm that will give me samples of x1 and x2? Do you know how to sample from the exponential distribution? We said log of 1 minus u, right? So yes, we can. So if you sample r, uh, can you com and you can sample theta, can you then compute x1 and x2? How do you go from polar now to Cartesian coordinates? x1 is r times cosine theta, r times sine theta, right? There it is. And there is your algorithm, OK? And I give you the algorithm. So you sample uh, you know, r from this exponential by starting with the uniform, you sample theta through also the uniform, and then you uh, uh, define x1 equal r cosine theta, r sine theta, and these are immediately sign, I mean, uh, samples from the standard uh, uh, normal, and these are the samples. So we know this is a much better algorithm actually to sample from the Gaussian, okay, by starting with samples from the uniform, then you go to the exponential, then you use this polar transformation coordinates, and this gives you sample section on next All right. Um, I have uh, another algorithm here that it's sort of an, uh, a very uh, uh, powerful algorithm to, sam to take samples from the standard normal. And uh, it goes with the name uh, box muller algorithm. Okay? And uh, I'm only going to highlight it. Okay? The, and uh, the algorithm is actually trivial to read it, but it's sort of a good example on uh, 
on uh, understanding or reminding yourselves on how distributions transform when you change uh, parametrization. So the algorithm works as follows, right? You sample Z1 and Z2 uh, on a uni uniformly on a unit circle. So the, uh, if you sample Z1 and Z2 from the unit circle, the distribution is 1 over pi times the indicator function. So you can think of a square of size 1. You sample uniformly from there. And if the sample is not in the circle, you don't accept it. Otherwise, you accept it. That's the indicator function here. And this is 1 over pi. Where is this 1 over pi came? What's the area of the unit circle? It's pi r squared, so it's pi. And if it is uniform, the probability would be 1 over pi. All right? So you sample uniformly on, uh, on a unit circle. And then you do two types of transformations, OK? One is you transform this Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates. You will need to find the Jacobian of the transformation from Cartesian to polar, which is here. And then actually you do one more transformation. Um, uh, you um, uh, use the polar coordinates, r and theta, to define y1 and y2. And then uh, when uh, you do, you know, you transform the variables and you go from z1 to z2 to y1, y2, and you do this in two steps, right? There is one transformation from r and theta to y1, y2, and then another transformation from z1, z2 to r and theta. So when you do all this together, the distribution you get is basically uh, the product of two univariate Gaussians. So actually, when you do this algorithm, you get two samples from the univariate Gaussian at the same time. And this algorithm is called the uh, Box-Muller algorithm. Literally, to implement it is uh, online, OK? And uh, this is an algorithm you will see uh, in programs like R and uh, MATLAB. Most probably, this is the type of implementation they have, the way they get uh, samples from a Gaussian. If you have uh, a correlated Gaussian, OK? And in this case, we're talking about a bivariate uh, Gaussian, OK? You can actually generate samples from a, a from uh, a you know, bivariate normal density by first sampling from the standard normal. So if you take a sample from the standard normal using this algorithm or whatever I gave you all the techniques before. So take samples from there and then generate x1 and x2. Okay, um, This is the mean uh, of the uh, bivariate uh, Gaussian. These are the standard deviations. And this is the correlation coefficient. So use sample z, okay? You sample two, two take take two samples z1 and z2, and then use those two samples to define x1 and x2, and you can show actually that these samples are coming from uh, uh, a bivariate Gaussian with means mu1, mu2, standard deviation sigma1, sigma2, and correlation coefficient rho. Okay, so um, you can actually show that this works. Okay, again. Uh, Literally, the algorithm is one line for this, okay, and then one line for this and one line for that, and this will be samples from a bivariate Gaussian. And actually, I show you uh, the implementation of this uh, uh, with uh, MATLAB, uh, so you can uh, uh, play with uh, the program if you're interested. All right. Uh, now, uh, are you, do you ever wonder on uh, how you can actually sample from a multivariate Gaussian? So if I give you a Gaussian in 50 dimensions, how do you sample in 50 dimensions? OK, so here's a trivial algorithm. Uh, so uh, we're going to start with samples. So we want to sample from this multivariate Gaussian. So we're going to take samples IID from the standard normal. Um, we're going to do what's called the Cholesky decomposition of the covariance matrix uh, sigma. So we are going to write this as S transpose. So this is a linear, linear algebra operation, the Cholesky decomposition. And then I claim that uh, 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 if you form x to be the mean of the Gaussian plus S times uh, this, uh, 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 let's say we, this uh, d-dimension Gaussian, a vector of uh, with d components that are samples from the standard normal, 
then I claim that this sex it's actually a sample from this multivariate Gaussian. An extremely wonderful, very compact formula. Okay, uh, you don't see this often in uh, in statistics books, but you know in machine learning, sort of this is the standard way of uh, getting samples from a multivariate Gaussian. You do the Cholesky decomposition, and then immediately X uh, gives you uh, a sample from the actual distribution, where Z are the samples coming from the standard normal. And you may say, I don't believe you. Why is this true? Look at that. Obviously, if you take the means here, the mean of Z is zero, so the mean of X is mu, so that's good. And if you take the covariance, take the expectation of this, uh, what is X minus mu is S Z, and this is Z transpose S transpose, so S S transpose is outside, and this is the covariance uh, Z, Z transpose, what is that? It's identity, right? Because this is the standard normal. So you have SS transpose, which is sigma. And that's the end of the proof. OK, again, step one, do this. Uh, this operation is in uh, uh, all toolboxes in all languages, right? It's a standard matrix decomposition. And then form X like that, and you're done. Now, the computation cost basically here uh, may be significant when, uh, if your covariance matrix is very high dimensional, so this algorithm actually may not be practical, okay? Uh, because all the cost is involved in being able to do it, so let's get the composition. Okay, uh, we have uh, 15 minutes, and I want now to, uh, to go to uh, more important methods. Uh, but at the end of the lecture today, maybe or on Tuesday, I'm going to tell you not to use them, but however, these methods are important because they change the paradigm as how you sample. Uh, they introduce a lot of new concepts on how you sample from uh, 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 implicit distribution. So the methodology goes with the name uh, rejection sampling. So first step I, uh, we're going to introduce is we're going to assume that we don't really know the actual distribution uh, up to a normalizing factor. So basically, we have some unnormalized version of the distribution. And I call this a normalized version pi star. All right? So basically, what is missing is I don't have the normalization factor of the distribution. So if you do Bayesian uh, inference, then pi star is the likelihood times the prior. You don't have the denominator. OK? All right? Uh, so here is uh, the, uh, the new concept. We're not going to, so we want to sample from uh, uh, pi of x, all right? that we only know up to this normalizing factor. But actually, uh, we will, uh, instead of sampling directly from pi that is difficult, we're going to sample from another distribution that we call a proposal distribution. OK? Uh, so we're not going to go directly to sample from pi, but we're going to sample from some other distribution that we call the proposal distribution. And this proposal distribution is also known up to uh, you know, the normalization factor, which, you know, so I call this a normalized distribution QSQ star. The idea here is if P is a very difficult distribution to sample, we're going to find some simpler distribution under some properties that somehow if we generate samples from that distribution, we may decide that those samples are actually samples from the distribution pi. They may. That's why the method is called accept or reject. Because some samples we will accept, some we will not. OK? Uh, so how do you construct Q? You're not going to take any arbitrary Q to actually do this. So what you need to do with this methodology, you have to find a Q that basically dominates pi. OK? So basically, what that means is um, uh, if you draw, let's say, the distribution pi, right, in practical sense, think of this in one dimension, Q star has to be on the top of that. OK? Uh, and also, that means that the tails of Q have to be thicker than the tails of pi. It's very important. Okay. So mathematically, what that means is that if you take the maximum for all x's of pi star divided by Q star, this is less than infinity. Okay. I'm going to show you this with a picture in one second, right? But again, Q needs to dominate pi. And uh, the uh, this equation, the way it is written, also implies that in regions where uh, the distribution pi is positive, Q has to be positive. Otherwise, right, I mean, if this 
sample is positive and this is zero, how do you expect to sample x from the regions where this is positive when this will give you nothing? Okay? Um, and that's why it's very important that the tails of the distribution Q, Q are thicker than the tails of the distribution pi. All right? Uh, so, uh, in practical sense, that uh, uh, equation that I had here, okay, uh, in practical sense, uh, I'm going to interpret it as uh, Q that needs to satisfy the pi star is less than M star times Q star for all X for some M prime greater than or equal to M that I had on the previous slide. So really this is, you, it's a theoretical bound that you will never be able to compute. So effectively we're looking for a distribution Q such that pi star at any X is less than M star times Q star at X. So our objective is to find the distribution Q that satisfies this for some M prime. All right? And sometimes this may be easy to compute. Sometimes uh, we will see it may not be easy to compute. So uh, here's the algorithm, OK? Uh, which is a big departure, actually, and introduces a lot of new ideas uh, uh, that are penetrating uh, very modern algorithms for sampling. So we're going to sample uh, y from the distribution q of y, all right? And also we're going to sample u from the uniform distribution. We cannot avoid this. We always go through the uniform distribution. So two samples, u from the uniform and y from q of y. The idea here is q of y is going to be an easy distribution to sample, like a Gaussian, like, you know, an exponential distribution, you know, or a gamma distribution. So we sample y from q of y and u from u to the uniform distribution. And then, this is very important, we are going to accept the sample y, so we're going to set x equal to y, with probability that is given by the ratio of p star of y divided by m star of q star of y. And uh, uh, now you may say, why did I also sample uh, u from the uniform distribution? Because a practical way to implement this criteria that says accept with probability that is if u is less than that, then you accept. If not, you reject. Okay, uh, this is the algorithm. That's it. Okay, I, I'm going to need to prove it, but you know it contains a lot of substance. Okay, so again, sample u from the uniform distribution, sample y from q of y, and then accept it when u is less than uh, p star of y divided by m prime q star of y. Okay, so you compute this normalized distribution at y, the q star at y. Okay, obviously the idea here is you should be able to compute this. Uh, you already have M prime. So if U comes to be less than that, then you say, wow, Y is then a sample from X and I accept it. And the question is why? Why is this working? All right? Okay? And uh, uh, so I, you know, uh, so I'm going to give you a proof shortly. If this thing is not satisfied, obviously you reject that sample. And then you take, uh, you return back and you take another sample from QY and another Q and you repeat, right? So many of the samples will not be accepted, but the ones that will be accepted are samples from the actual distribution pi of x. Extremely powerful uh, idea and introduces many new concepts, right? The fact, no, don't sample directly from pi because it's difficult. Sample from this proposal distribution. So there is some new concept here, proposal distribution. And then the second important step is whatever samples you take, uh, you may reject them or you may accept them with some criteria. Okay, so this concept is also very new here uh, that uh, many other methodologies include as well. All right, so uh, proof, okay? Uh, let me first give you sort of the graphical representation since I, I said I will give you a graph. So this is uh, the distribution pi star, all right? And on the top of it is this parameter m prime that you need to compute times q star. Remember, pi star and q star are all anormalized. So this is pi star. So you find the distribution that's on the top of pi star. So this is m prime q star. And uh, here is the idea uh, when, um, uh, if you remember on the algorithm, uh, you are going to select u. 
and uh, you are going to accept, okay, when, uh, uh, all right, you are going to accept uh, when M prime, what is the criterion? Okay, here it is. So when M prime times Q star at Y times U, all right, is less than pi star of Y, so if you are on this darker region here, all right, if U gives you an M prime Q star times U to be inside that region, you accept. If you are in that region, you reject. Okay, so sort of this is a, a way to visualize this. Okay, um, so if U times M star Q star at Y, all right, you do this evaluation at this upper Y, if this is less than this value here, okay, which is pi star at, at this point y, then you accept, okay, otherwise you reject. Um, the, and again, uh, we don't know the normalization factor of the distribution, which is also a major uh, plus for this type of methodologies. Let me just uh, uh, very fast give you a proof and then we will finish there, okay. Uh, the proof is uh, sort of uh, a nice application of Bayes' formula and nothing else. So let me define uh, J to be 1 if a proposed sample is accepted, 0 otherwise. Okay? So I define J if the sample Y I accepted, 0 otherwise. Okay? So we want to find uh, the probability first that I accept a sample. I'm going to do this in two steps. The probability that I accept a sample. Can I write this? as uh, this integral and tell me what rules of probability am I using to write this probability that I accept uh, as this integral. What is involved from here to left to this equation? What rules of probability? Product and some rules, right? Okay. Uh, so the idea is, you know, I condition this on y, all right? Uh, and y comes from the distribution q of y, okay? So uh, you can think of this as being a discrete variable, right? One and zero, okay? So this is really the product rule and then the sum rule because I'm marginalized on y, okay? So, uh, so I have this integral, all right? Uh, this says is the probability that I accept given that my sample is y. Do you agree with me by the, the algorithm that this is the probability of acceptance? Right, the algorithm says this is the probability of acceptance here. Okay, and then I have Q, and what is Q? It's basically uh, the anormalized Q, Q star, divided by the normalization factor, which is here. Okay, so uh, uh, let's see what we get here. This Q star in the integral, this Q star cancel, and then I have an integral of pi star, which is the normalization factor of pi, and then on the denominator I have M prime, times the normalization factor of, uh, Q of the distribution Q, okay? Uh, I am going to use this result, right? So this is an intermediate result, but basically the probability of acceptance is given by the ratio of two normalization factors uh, times on the denominator of this constant M prime. Uh, here is now why the sample X, if it is accepted, is the correct sample. So I'm computing the probability that Y is equal to X so you remember, we take a sample x, we take a sample y, and uh, if we accept it, then this becomes a sample x from the true distribution. So I use uh, Bayes' rule, basically, to reverse uh, uh, the statements here. So this is the probability that I accept, given that y equal to x times the probability of y equal to x. And this is the normalization factor P of acceptance uh, of acceptance basically and uh, I start plugging in things okay so uh, look at this thing here it says the probability that I accept given that y equal to x do you agree with me that this is the acceptance probability right that's the algorithm says this is the acceptance probability okay and uh, then I have the probability of y equal to x all right that's Q of X, because this is where, from where I sample. I sample from the distribution Q of X. And then I have the this probability of acceptance that is really Z divided by M prime times this integral. So let's see what happens. 
Q uh, star divided by the normalization factor, this divided by this gives me Q. So this term and that term and that term cancel. So what actually I get is P star divided by Z and M prime and M prime cancel. And P star divided by Z is actually P of X. So if you accept, all right, the samples X that you get are actually samples from the true distribution. If you don't like this proof, I have uh, an alternative proof uh, that maybe looks simpler, but basically follows the same idea that you may want uh, to do. So because it's 1220, let me just finish with the following thing. Let's look at the probability of acceptance, okay? It's basically the normalization factor of pi divided by the normalization factor of q times m prime. So what happens is, as you try to find the distribution q, right, that is on the top of the distribution pi, you're trying to select a very big m prime, but look what happens. The bigger the m prime, the smaller the probability of acceptance. So if you try to bound something from infinity, good luck, because then the probability of acceptance is going to be zero, so you will be sampling going upward. Which means uh, the tricky part here is to actually uh, try to figure out uh, the sort of the, uh, you really want to be as close as possible to the actual distribution, right? But you don't want to do this at, uh, uh, you know, uh, at an extreme cost. So the number of times that you need to try before you accept a, a candidate is given by one over this probability, okay? And so I'm gonna pick it up from there on uh, uh, next Tuesday, and, uh, uh, and then we will discuss um, uh, important something.